During the past year, those of us who followed the constantly changing legislative, political, and policy battles around the seemingly unending battle over health care reform discovered that there were two places we had to turn to constantly to figure out what was going on, and those were the blogs of Ezra Klein, writing on the website of the Washington Post, and of Jonathan Cohn, writing on the website of the New Republic. They broke news and they provided context, and in so doing, they showed how bloggers writing at the right topic at the right time could really advance uh, the state of the art of serious journalism at precisely the moment when serious journalism has never been more imperiled. And the, the 2010 Hillman Prize for Best Blog goes to John Cohn and Ezra Klein. When we started the blog, on the health care reform debate in early 2009, I remember very distinctly thinking, well, this will be nice. This will be a, a little diversion. While I write my biweekly print pieces for the New Republic, I'll have this little online thing going, and people will read it, and that'll get them interested in the print pieces. Of course, that turned out to basically be backwards. Um, the blog became the driver of my coverage. It became what I spent most of my time doing. And I, I will tell you, I felt guilty about that. I'm a print person. I felt very guilty. It was like, oh, God, I'm going to blog. I don't... Shouldn't be, I should be doing a print piece. I shouldn't be doing this online thing. It's, it's too much fun. Gradually, I came to realize that this is the way uh, journalism is evolving. And I have a very distinct memory of one particular moment in the healthcare debate when it hit me the, the significance of what we were doing, uh, those of us who were covering this online. Um, it was in September. I don't know how many of you followed this that closely, but you may remember there was this small issue of getting healthcare reform through the Senate Finance Committee. Um, and there's a senator from Montana who some people don't like so much, and was having a little trouble getting it out of committee. And he'd finally gotten the votes together. They were on the verge of passing this. And then on a Sunday, magically, this study appeared from the health insurance industry. Um, I should say, study. Um, it was commissioned from an accounting firm. And it purported to show that health care reform, if it passed, would cause everybody's rates to skyrocket. And it was dropped on a Sunday. The vote was scheduled for Tuesday morning. And it was quite obvious what was going on here. This is an old trick in Washington. You, you get the rigged study. You drop it a day before something is supposed to happen. And by the time everyone has sorted through all the noise and figured out that there's nothing to the study that is really bogus, the damage has been done. And either the bill has been killed or, or something, something has changed. And I'm quite sure that was the intent. They leaked it to a newspaper. It popped up on the website uh, of various uh, news organizations Sunday night. But what was different this time, during this debate, was that within 12 hours, the world of online journalism was all over this. And wherever you looked, you would get the real story, which was that, yes, this study did show that it would cause premiums to rise. That's because they took all of the possible variables that would affect health insurance premiums in this bill. And they sort of basically, they divided them into two columns. Here are the ones that would cause expenses to rise, and here's the ones that would cause expenses to fall. Let's ignore that second column. <laughs> Let's just look at the stuff that's going to make it cost more money. I, I, I'm not making this up. This is exactly what they did. And you have to think, how stupid do they think people were that they would follow this? Well, you know, they've been around Washington. <laughs> Washington's always this stupid and false, except this time it wasn't. And by the way, it turned out to be such a boondoggle for them that if you, today you talk to people who work for the Senate Finance Committee, you ask them, what finally got that bill out? They'll say, it was that awful health insurance study. You know, it was so bad and was so exposed that even, like, Max Bach has got angry at the insurance industry. <laughs> and um, it was that moment I said, you know, this isn't a lesser form of journalism. This is journalism. This is good journalism. This is journalism at its best. And while I'd like to take credit for, you know, I, I suppose I was a little part of this, honestly, it is people like Ezra who really invented this, and people like Josh Marshall, who I know won this award several years ago, who I think someday, 20 years from now, we're going to be looking back and reading about them as people who invented this new form of journalism, and we'll think, well, this is where it started. Um, I suppose I should thank my family. Uh, they gave up a lot of my time. I am convinced that the 10-year-old with a Twitter account is going to become a reactionary because healthcare reform is what stole his dad for 18 months. <laughs> That's why I don't want him getting the Twitter account. Um, but I also, I, I just as a kind of parting note, I, I want to thank the people who over the years made me care about this issue. You know, people always ask me, why did you start writing about health care reform? And I, I feel like I should have some personal story. I should have, you know, this happened to me or I knew this. And, and that, none of that is true. It, it was a mix of circumstance. I just sort of fell into it. 
The reason I became obsessed with the issue, though, was the time I spent in people's living rooms and listening to them tell their stories. Um, you know, the couple in San Diego who did 30 years and out at the Morel Meatpacking Plant in South Dakota on a promise of retirement health benefits, among other things, and then had them yanked away because it turned out the piece of paper they signed wasn't actually signed by the company, and a Reagan-era court said, well, that meant the agreement was null and void, and they, were gonna have, they had no recourse, they were going to lose their health benefits. And the woman in Texas with a boy with cerebral palsy, whose insurance company wouldn't cover the standard physical uh, therapy treatment, and she got it eventually by basically giving up uh, her house and then giving up her marriage. And the man here in upstate New York who had the perfect American dream life right down to that Norman Rockwell home in the little village of 400 people who watched his wife die of cancer and then with three young kids had to declare bankruptcy because two years earlier, the defense contractor for which he had worked laid him off and then hired him back as an independent contractor without benefits. You know, I mentioned ambivalence, and I know there's a lot of people who feel very ambivalent about health care reform, the Affordable Care Act, as it, as it passed. Well, I feel that, too, and I could, I, could, I, could, I could fill an article, in fact, I think I have, talking about all the flaws in the Affordable Care Act. But at the end of the day, I always come back to, and the reason I, 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 I would always ask people reading the blog to think about was that whatever this law does or doesn't do, I know, I am confident that those three people, if they were to have that happen today, and the millions who find themselves in that situation, they will be better off. And uh, those of you who know your history know that Franklin Roosevelt used to say he'd want to make sure, you know, clear it with Sidney. Well, I'd like to think if Sidney Hillman were around today and he had a chance to, to look over the Affordable Care Act, he would, he would go ahead and clear that too. So thank you. Thank you for this. And, uh, Thank you.